The Fellows Forum is our traditional time to gather together to discuss big issues facing the profession and to consider the role of the college in the context of that issue. Our topic today is the opening session of what will be at least a year-long active participatory exploration of medical dental integration and how the college might foster better health outcomes for all through the integration. The ACD will host an ethics summit on medical dental integration in August of 2024, bringing together interested organizations and thought leaders from across the profession. Doctors Tony Ruka and Scott Tomar, fellows, are today's moderators and have put together a panel of experts to begin the conversation among us fellows. Tony Ruka is currently the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Marquette University. And Scott Tomar is Associate Dean for Prevention in Public Health Sciences and a professor in the Department of Pediatric Dentistry at the University of Illinois. Both Drs. Ruka and Tomar are fellows of the college. Dr. Ruka, Ruka and Dr. Tomar, please introduce our topic and our panel. So thank you so much. Sorry for the rough start this morning. Um, welcome to the 2023 Fellows Forum. We're really excited to present this topic this morning, the ethics of medical and dental integration, starting the conversation within the dental profession. So Scott and I will um, be asking our panelists questions, but first we'll start with a 20-minute presentation from each panelist. But at this time, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Marco Vucevic is the current, is the current chief economist and vice president of health policy in the Institute at American Dental Association. <coughs> he is recognized, he's a recognized thought leader in healthcare policy as it relates to dental care. He has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals, such as Health Affairs, the New England Journal of Medicine, and his team's work is regularly cited by CNN, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, and other media outlets. Previously, he was senior economist with the World Bank in Washington, D.C., focusing on health systems reform in developing countries. Scott, are you mic'd up now? <laughs> no, okay. Um, Ira B. Lamster, Dr. Ira Lamster, served as Dean of Columbia University College of Dental Medicine from 2001 to 2012 and Senior Vice President of Columbia University Medical Center 2006 to 2012. Dr. Lamster is currently Dean Emeritus Columbia University College of Dental Medicine and Clinical Professor of Stony Brook University School of Dental Medicine. He is also a member of the Santa Fe Group leading the development of the Coalition for Oral Health Policy. Dr. Lamster's research efforts have focused on diagnostic testing and risk, risk assessment for periodontal disease, the interrelationship of periodontal disease and systemic disease, the oral health needs of older adults, and the future of dental education practice. His research is supported, is supported by NIH corporations and foundations. And finally, Dr. Art Ristanov, the Walter C. Berlin Distinguished Professor of Oral Medicine and Maxillofacial Surgery and Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor, served as Dean of Harvard School of Dental Medicine from 1991 to 2019. In addition to leading the school as his dean, Dr. Danoff, as dean, Dr. Danoff made major contributions in research to the specialty of oral and maxillofacial surgery. Started. 
with, um, with Marco's presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Marco. Uh, it's going to be a great discussion. Uh, but first, I really want to just thank the college for inviting me to this, uh, for giving me the honor of being inducted as a fellow. This is exciting. I'm not a dentist. Um, those of you that know me, I have a lot of ideas that sometimes don't sit well with dentists. Um, so it's, it's nice to, to be recognized, at least for making us think and sometimes be uncomfortable. But honestly, it's a real, it's a real honor. Thank you uh, for whoever nominated me and, and, and for the honor. Um, I'm going to kick off with some very 30,000 foot thinking. So I have no clinical experience. Uh, what, what my team does at the ADA research. We do a lot of analysis of data, nothing clinical, but trends in industry. Um, so it's very data-driven, scientific. Uh, that's different than being interesting and relevant. Uh, but thankfully, a lot of our work is increasingly incorporated into the debates, into the popular press, into forums like this. Um, so it's important that you know who I am and where I'm coming from. So I am a dispassionate analyst. I have an economics background, uh, but I am, part of what my group does is look at trends outside of the industry. Look at what's happening in healthcare policy overall. Look at what's happening in household trends and consumerism. And really try to bring some important insights to leadership in the industry, in the ADA, outside the ADA, groups like you. Uh, that's really what, what my team is about. And so this morning, I really wanted to start with, and I really loved, uh, again, congratulations, Terry. Uh, but one of the things she put up was that quote about you cannot be healthy without a healthy mouth, or oral health is part of health. That's the focus of our whole discussion today, is about integration and kind of reconnecting out the body. But when we look at the data, that quote was from 2000. And two years ago, we had a very large NIDCR-led 20-year uh, retrospective looking at, well, wait a minute, we kind of made a bold statement, the Surgeon General did in 2000. Where are we in 2020 in terms of the nation's oral health? And one of the huge conclusions was, for children, we've made a lot of progress in 20 years. More kids in dental homes untreated carries rates declining. And the biggest increases were among the most vulnerable kids. Okay. So kind of the children's trends were a good story, so to speak, looking at that 20-year retrospective. For adults and seniors, completely different story. And if you haven't looked at the report, just go look at the Oral Health in America. Just look at the taglines. We've done zero improvements for working age adults. Right? You look at untreated disease rates, or you look at how many are going to the dentist, we've stalled. And the data are crystal clear on that. For older Americans, most metrics have stalled, some have not. There have been improvements, for example, in the dentition, retaining dentition and stuff. But unlike for kids, among the senior population, the improvements in oral health have been focused among high income groups. So those disparities are widening by race, by income, unlike children. So the point here is we have to face up to the reality that whatever we're saying and however important we all think oral health is as a nation, other than children, we're not moving the needle. And so a few years ago, I wrote a piece kind of. I think you guys are not by there. So I, I wrote a piece a few years ago provocatively calling it, we're stuck. And from a policy lens where I sit, what would we actually need to do to significantly advance oral health and to basically get a ton more Americans accessing dental care? And one of the things is really to change this delivery model. Right? So in a nutshell, and this is what our panel's gonna talk about, I, from where I sit, I don't think will significantly get more Americans accessing dental care with at least, in part, breaking down the silo between the dental care system and let's call it the primary care overall. Right? So there are a lot of other things we need to do to, to kind of fix 
explode upon the system. Like our insurance model is broken. Right? We need to reform how dental insurance works. That's one of the things I highlighted. But this siloing of the delivery model is something very important to discuss. And I'm not saying do it or don't do it. But as an analyst, I'm saying the reason why we're not seeing as much improvement in oral health in the population is because we are having a separate dental care system than the rest of the health care system. Now, many people love that. Right? A lot of dentists go into the profession because of that. That's all fair. But we cannot be preaching oral health is connected to full body health. Every diabetic into a dental home in today's delivery model. And this is the controversy. And the point is, this is why I think we're at a very crucial moment for this profession, for oral health in America, is because kind of the system has delivered as much as it's going to deliver the way it's been designed. Right? It works pretty well for middle to upper income adults and seniors and most children. The rest fall through the cracks. The system works pretty well for, for dentists, right, and, health, and dental care providers. Um, good income, lots of interest in the profession, etc. But if we want to go to that next level, for example, what would it take for every newly diagnosed person with diabetes to be referred automatically for an oral health screening? What would that take? Right? That's the kind of questions, if we're serious, that takes a lot. It takes getting that script on the primary care physician or nurse practitioner's worksheet. Right? That's not happening right now. What do you do then to refer somebody? The, the systems don't talk to each other. Right? You go to first screening to your internist or something, they're like, okay, go get this exam, go see the cardiologist, here's the cardiologist script, go book the appointment on your way out, boom doesn't happen like that in dental because it's a separate system, separate payment model, separate delivery model, separate IT systems, etc. Okay? So that's the, the, the uncomfortable debate, or that's where I feel we need to talk about as a profession. Like, what is the vision? If the vision is that, it comes with a lot of change, and it comes with a lot of uncomfortable change. Again, and. Please, I'm not saying do X or do Y. I'm posing the question because we're at a point where these questions need to be answered. So I, Bruce and, and, and I are going to talk a bit more about the nuts and bolts of that. What I think is very interesting, and I want to, I, I, because I'm talking to providers, I wanted to show you why I think on the provider side, a lot of things are changing to potentially make dentists more open to these different types of delivery models. And here it is. We have a big generational turnover happening among dentists, okay? With baby boomer cohort dentists slowly exiting the market and a lot more millennial and soon Gen Z um, dentists coming into the market. So, not to go back to our high school statistics, but this is a bell curve of the age distribution of dentists 20 years ago. I promise you the statistics will give us insights. Um, what do you see? It's pretty smooth, right? We had a lot of dentists 20 years ago who were in their 40s, and we didn't have many in their 30s, and we didn't have many in their 60s at all. So there was like an average dentist. It was a he, it was white, solo practice in their 40s, okay? What's changed dramatically is how this looks five years ago. Look at this. By 2017, we no longer see that smooth bell curve shape that we got used to in high school statistics. We see like a bimodal distribution if you're wonky, or bat ears if you're into biology, or two groups of dentists emerging. All of a sudden, we have a lot of dentists in their 30s five years ago. A lot. And we have a lot in their 60s, right? Well, those a lot in their 60s were those that were 40s 20 years ago, right? That's that big surge of training that happened in the 80s, and they're moving in the system, right? Why do we have so many dentists now in their 30s? Why? Turning to you, shout out. Where did all the... Okay, so there's 70 dental schools today, right? Dental school enrollment has really increased significantly. So we don't train 
providers in this country with a slow drip of the faucet, right? It comes in surges. So there were surges in the 80s, then dental schools closed. Surges in the 2000s, um, and more surges. Um, so the, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because, like many things in America, the average today is not that important, right? They have kind of two groups here of providers moving through the system. We have a large group of that baby boomer cohort. And again, trained differently, wanting to be solo practice, many in solo practice. Um, again, the, 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 the race and, and, and gender data are very stark. 56% of the income in class last fall was women in dental school. It's not even 50-50, it's 56-44. So that's a significant change, right? Um, you heard earlier, practice models are changing. Yeah, the group on the left is much more in groups, um, less ownership, more in DSOs, so there's a whole practice model evolution. So what I'm interested in is, as this advances to today, so just look at this five-year change. Baby boomer dentist numbers fall, and we continue to see increases in the millennial generation of dentists. So what's happening now, this is what I mean by this generational turnover, right? In the next five years, most of that group on the right will have retired, right? And we're gonna be in a situation where the workforce is much younger, predominantly female, predominantly in models that are different than today. And so my question becomes, is this one of the things that may spur on more of this medical dental integration? I don't know, I don't, I don't sit in dental schools, I research young dentists a lot, but the question I think one of, we, I, I wanna ask the panel is, do you think a 27 year old dentist today or somebody just going into dental school today is open to working in a large organization that collaborates with primary care or Walgreens or the Walmarts or the Kaiser Permanentes of the world? Or are we still bringing people into this profession who don't want that? They want to be separate, quote unquote, from medicine. Um, because we cannot have this both ways. So I'm gonna end just with these three questions because I really think that the, the trends to me suggest we're at an important whatever you want to call it, inflection point or a fork in the road, um, to, you know, to, to borrow Robert Frost's analogy. Um, I think these are questions, not that are just interesting anymore, but somebody needs to answer them. Because the profession right now, I feel, does not have a clear vision for the next 30 years on are we okay with the way delivery and financing is working today? And if you say yes to that, then don't say I also wanna get millions of more people into dental homes and I want every diabetic referred into a dentist. You cannot have it both ways. Or do we wanna say it's time for the profession to have a different vision? Maybe we want to be more collaborative with the primary care system. Do I want CVS to automatically, when they fill medications for heart disease, diabetes, um, pregnancy care, boom, something pops up and says, have you had a dental screening? And if the answer is no, here's a tool that helps you actually find that. And then what do you do with the payment model, right? For example, it, it's great that we talk about mouth-body connection, but the vast majority of seniors don't have any coverage for dental, right? So to ask them to just pay out of pocket for a dental screening because they got newly diagnosed with diabetes or something, I don't think that's feasible in today's world anymore. Um, but anyway, I'll leave you with this. So question one, I think, is honestly, do you want to get millions of more Americans into dental home? The 20-year trend suggests for adults and seniors we're not doing much, right? Um, do we really think dentistry is essential health care? Or do we use that essential when it's kind of convenient? Like in a pandemic to get PPE, make sure we're essential so we're on the list. <laughs> But when it comes to Medicare and dental, maybe we have a different view of what essential care is, or Obamacare. Obamacare was a codification of essential services in the law. And adult and dental, a uh, dental for adults and seniors was not put in that, right? So those are the kinds of things I talk about, I mean when I say essential. I don't mean, Marco, do you think dentistry is essential? Of course I do. I can't be healthy without a healthy mouth but health policy does not say dentistry is essential other than for kids, it's very clear. 
right? There's optional benefits in Medicaid. Medicare Advantage is a crazy wild west in terms of plans having one cleaning versus four cleanings versus covering nothing. You get where I'm going. So do we really think this is an essential service or is it something more discretionary? I prefer you pay out of pocket. I don't want to deal with insurance. That's a different vision. Again, both are valid and both can, I mean, I'm, I'm not judging anything here. Again, I'm just laying out the questions. Um, and then the third is really about this walking the, the talk, so to speak, right? Uh, again, mouth connected to body is a great tagline, um, but to truly, truly move the system so that medical providers live this. Payer community lives this. Oh, diabetes? Oh, boom. Automatically, a dental screening is paid for in your medical insurance plan. That's something I'm talking about, right? So I don't have those answers. It's not for me to answer those. Uh, but again, I just thought, given where the trends are going, I feel leaders in dentistry, you're part of that group. ADA, we talk about this a lot. I know there's a couple former presidents here, too, uh, can chime in. They're not easy questions to answer. Um, but the reason why I put those, statistics, those distributions up is, I don't know, it's a reflection. Is it, is it maybe a moment in time where there's so much change among the clinician community and the generational shift among dentists themselves that maybe the viewpoints to these questions may not be the same for like a 27-year-old dentist versus 67-year-old dentist? I don't know. Um, but hopefully we'll get a chance to talk more about these. Um, and while the next person comes up, just because I want to take advantage, you can get in touch with me here um, if you want to follow up. So thank you. That's all. Great. Well, good morning. Before my slides come up, let me also uh, thank the American College for inviting me in to be a panel participant with my colleagues, Marco Vujicic and uh, Bruce Donoff. Um, and I think that the, that the topic today rep represents, I think, one of the most important questions we must ask ourselves as we look to the future. Uh, this is a topic that I've thought a great deal about, but I've looked at it always from the financial perspective. How do we reimburse? I've looked at it from the health or oral health perspective. But when the, the college asked the question, is this an ethical question? <clears throat> to me, I think that was a different way of looking at it. So I'm gonna answer my, that question with my second slide and then provide you with what I refer to as a quantitative rationale for why we should be thinking this way. So this is, this is not C. Everett Koop, this is Ira Lamster's statement about the question. I said, a fully engaged healthcare professional, or fully engaged healthcare professionals, are concerned with the health and well-being of patients. Dental professionals are in an ideal position to contribute to improving the general health and oral health of their patients. So we have a healthcare-seeking population in a healthcare environment. This is an opportunity that should not be dismissed and should not be, should not be missed. When you talk about medical dental integration, and Marco touched on a number of these points, there's a number of ways you have to look at this. And I've listed just a couple of them here. There's changes to the dental education paradigm. We can't expect a, a new practice paradigm unless we begin to educate our students now as to what this means. Is it just talking about the, the co-location of medical and dental care. Uh, the FQHCs, I think, have done this uh, effectively, but there's, there's questions as to how real is the actual integration. And something that I'm gonna really be talking about in greater detail today, and that's primary care activities in the dental office. So let me just give you some population data. Uh, this is data from 2019 from the uh, medical expenditure analysis that the federal government does periodically. <clears throat> and this is the number of persons who have a medical or dental visit. And as you can see, 29.5% or 29.5 29 million, excuse me, million individuals, almost 30 million people in 2019 had a dental visit but did not have a medical visit. In addition to that, 120 
a little more than 120 million people had both a dental and medical visit, meaning that essentially about half the population see a dentist. These are adults who see a dentist. Then, of course, there are individuals who see none or who just see a medical provider. So again, the opportunity to reach 50% of the adult population, again, the data is as current as available, again, is imposing. Here again, from a general perspective, what are the potential screening opportunities that can move forward in the dental office? Well, there's the low-hanging fruit, hypertension screening. We've been talking about that as a profession for probably 75 years now. Uh, HPV vaccination education, tobacco screening, certainly diabetes assessment, et cetera. And then there are other, many other, that have, many other types of procedures that have been proposed. Uh, some of them are directly, will directely impact the delivery of dental care. Some will not, but still of value to the patients. So what I decided to do today is provide you what, what I refer to as quantitative rationale. What does the data say in terms of the potential value of integrating medicine and dentistry in the truest sense? So I'm gonna to talk to you about three parts of, the, of, this, of this question, all of which, all of this data I've been involved in uh, for the last 25 years, maybe even longer than that. And my, fo my focus is gonna be on diabetes mellitus and Marco alluded to that in, in his presentation. The first is, can we identify undiagnosed dysglycemia in the dental office? Now, there have been a number of studies that have looked at this. We've participated in one, and I'm gonna show you just some of the data from that study that was, that was uh, performed at Columbia University in northern Manhattan, a primarily Hispanic uh, community. So our aim was really quite simple. It's stated here to develop and evaluate a targeted screening protocol for undiagnosed dysglycemia. And this includes both diabetes and pre-diabetes pre uh, in patients presenting to a dental clinic who were there for dental services. They did not come to be screened or to be evaluated for a medical condition or diabetes mellitus. So here's the rationale, and there are six points. There's an increasing prevalence of diabetes in the U.S., and currently 23% of the adult population would classify as having diabetes. A larger, significantly larger a percentage, excuse me, of the population would actually uh, uh, be diagnosed with prediabetes in this interim between normal, uh, normal blood sugar levels in, in, in blood um, and, and true diabetes. And the importance of, of prediabetes is that oftentimes it is reversible with the appropriate treatment, and sometimes treatment can be as simple as lifestyle changes. The complications of diabetes mellitus are very significant in terms of both morbidity and mortality. And you're familiar with these. The retinopathy, nephropathy, cardiovascular disease, and nephropathy, and poor wound healing. And the, and the cost to the, to, uh, the U.S. Uh, healthcare system in terms of treating these patients is well over $200 billion a year. Third point, we do know that early diagnosis of diabetes mellitus with treatment, with treatment, will lead to reduction in complications. So the quality of life issues, in addition to all the other advantages, how patients will benefit, I think, is enormous. We know that patients with diabetes, diabetes mellitus have oral complications, and many of them, I think a total of 11 different complications have been identified. Some of them you're quite familiar with because they're, because they're common. These include an increase in periodontal disease, dry mouth, burning mouth syndrome, candida infection, complications of, of implants, etc. Oral complications of DM um, occur early. We did a study looking at young individuals in our community, uh, children and adolescents, who had type 2 diabetes, and we found that changes in the gingiva, infl inflammatory changes, loss of attachment, actually preceded nephropathy. And lastly, we know that successful care for patients with DM requires good metabolic control. If you treat a uh, patient presents who, who has diabetes mellitus and has periodontal disease, and you treat the periodontal disease, you don't really address the metabolic control, your, your care will not be successful. So we did a study. Ultimately, the study involved 1,200 people. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delve into data, but bear with me. Uh, I'm just going to show you the first part of the study. It was very basic. These were patients who presented to the dental clinic at Columbia for dental services. 
And the criteria for, for asking them if they wanted to be in the study was that if you, were four, you had to be at least 40 years old, if you were non-Hispanic white, or over 30 years old, if you're Hispanic or non-white, because the risk factors for diabetes in, non -his in, in Hispanics and, and non-whites is higher at an earlier age. And they had, never, they had to have never been told, never were told, that they had diabetes, and they agreed to participate. They had to answer one of these questions in, in the affirmative. Do you have a family history of diabetes? Do you personally have hypertension, high cholesterol, or overweight and obesity? And they had to agree to, to continue in the study. And, and let me just go back one second. The study included okay, a periodontal examination, but it also included a point of care HbA1c, glyc glycated hemoglobin test, at the same time that they had their, their dental examination. But the gold standard for diabetes at this time was fasting plasma glucose, so they had to come back the next day, the next morning, for a fasting plasma glucose. Now, the first bit of data from this study that really surprised us was that 95% of those people who qualified, 95% came back the next day for uh, the, the fasting plasma glucose, which is a, a blood draw, which is which was much higher than we expected. And, and to summarize the findings, we that 4.2% uh, of this group of 506 individuals were in the diabetes range by fasting plasma glucose, and 31.8% were in the pre-diabetes range. So we asked the question, we said, you know, the, the return on investment here, the, the cost-benefit ratio, was not that favorable. We were only picking up 36% of the individuals who were in this, this category that we wanted to, to or these two categories we wanted to identify. So then we started looking at the dental data, and we said, what are the criteria for, for, in an oral examination which might improve our yield? So we, we settled on the percent of teeth with sites greater than or equal to, to five millimeters, probing depth that is, and the number of missing teeth would here, would here happen to be, to be four. And we were able to adjust the, the uh, cutoff value with appropriate cutoff values. We were able to adjust the yield to between 73 and 92 percent in terms of identification of people who are in one of these two categories. I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but let's just take a look at the first column, sensitivity, which is a statistical measure of the true positives in the population. And you can see all the way to the left the certain criteria, whether it was dental criteria, whether it was dental criteria plus this point of care um, HbA1c measure or just the point of care HbA1c, you can see the sensitivities range between 73 and 92 percent. So using relatively simple um, screening tools, a finger stick test in the dental office, uh, dental examinations, which we're doing anyway, we were able to pick up between 73 and 92 percent of those that were in the dysglycemic range. We then said to ourselves, well, you know, we're not making a diagnosis here. Let's make that very clear. But we're identifying people who are at risk. And again, the gold standard here being this fasting plasma glucose the next morning. So we had, a, we had enough funds to, to to conduct a small referral pilot. We wanted to see if we could deliver a message to patients, tell, telling them what we found, and telling them they needed to go see a medical provider. So we looked at just about 100 patients, and there were two groups. One just had what we called the regular follow-up, which means we gave them a letter saying, this is what we found, please go see a, a, a physician or a medical provider. And the other group, which we called the intensive group, we did the same thing, but then we followed it up with phone calls over the next couple of weeks. If you look at the percentage or the number that returned six months later, because we called them back six months later, 73 of the 101 actually returned. That's a very high yield in this population. It's a much larger number we expected than we expected to come back. We asked what percentage of these individuals saw a, a, a physician or a medical provider, and it was 60%. So 73% came back, or 73 of the 101 came back. 60 of the 101, or 59, 60%, actually had followed up and taken our advice to see a medical provider. By the way, there was no difference between the intensive and regular follow-up groups and the percentage that were tested. That, that was, I think, pretty impressive, to have 60% of the individuals who we told you had some sort of, of a concern, some sort of a, a medical issue, you had to follow up, listen to us, 
and then followed up with a provider and then came back to see us. So what were the key, the key clinical outcomes from this study? Again, 73 of 101 subjects returned at six months. Almost 60% reported having seen a physician. Almost 50% reported one, at least one positive lifestyle change. So again, for prediabetes, the idea of exercise, weight loss, et cetera, really is the first line of therapy. And for those participants with DM, and they're relatively, relatively few, only seven, so this is certainly not definitive, we found that the reduction between what we determined initially and what, the, what we saw at six months, the average reduction in HbA1c was 1.46%. Now remember, HbA1c is measured on a scale that goes from about four or five to maybe 12 or 13. So a reduction of 1.5 units, 1.5%, is very, very significant. Second point, conservative periodontal treatment is associated with reduced glycated hemoglobin. Let me point out, and I think most of you know, that now glycated hemoglobin represents perhaps the most important, most valuable monitoring tool, monitoring assessment in terms of the management of a person with diabetes over their life course. <clears throat> this was looked at by what's referred to as the Cochrane Library or Cochrane Collaborative. And what this is, is an organization that tries to, in a very rigorous way, look at the, the data that asks a particular or answer, is intended to answer a particular question. Here's the treatment and here's the outcome. What are the results? And the studies are conducted differently. So they have certain criteria for admitting one of the published <coughs> studies into their analysis, and then they try to make make a whole out of these disparate parts. This was the most recent uh, review, and it was published in 2022. Let me point out, this is the third review that this group has done on this question, the third review. Here were the findings. They used 35 studies. Again, this has been done, this analysis has been done across the globe, mostly type two patients, and a little over 3,000 patients were included. They looked at only randomized controlled trials. Did you have cases? Did you have controls? Were they treated the same way, et cetera? And the follow-up was three to 12 months. And what they found was that the reduction over this period following conservative periodontal therapy in patients who had relatively high levels of HbA1c was a 0.43 to 0.5 reduction in HbA1c, clinically significant and statistically significant. And here is a direct quote from that paper, again, this third Cochrane Review, we now have moderate certainty that periodontal treatment using subgingival in instrumentation improves glycemic, glycemic control in patients with both periodontitis and diabetes by a clinically significant amount when compared to no treatment or usual treatment. That's a pretty powerful statement. Second, further trials, and this is really the key, evaluating periodontal treatment versus no treatment are unlikely to change the overall conclusion of this review. The third time they did this, and they were able to make that statement, the first two times they did the review in earlier years, they simply they felt was not enough data to, to draw a, a valid conclusion. Now they felt there was. So that's the second point. And here's the third, and this is perhaps the most controversial of all. Conservative periodontal treatment is associated with improved health outcomes, reduced utilization, and lower costs. And again, there are probably about now about nine or 10 studies that have looked at this, um, the majority from the United States, but also from Germany, the Netherlands, et cetera. So this is a study that we published in 2001, and it just prompts me to, to tell you a little bit about the study itself. What was beautiful about the Medicaid program in New York State is number one, it had dental data, but it, and, and it also had medical data. And the dental coverage in Medicaid in New York State is probably the most robust for adults of any state in, in the country. So we had all of this data together. Now we were particularly interested in the people over 65, but this population was only between 42 and 64 because the medical and dental data were, were together. We looked at people over 65, the medical data really was in the Medicare database, which we did not have direct access to. It was a three-year evaluation, and we looked at people who were continuously enrolled for three years. Um, and the first two years, we assessed 
what kind of dental treatment do they have or how much dental care do they have. And the third year, we looked at their medical outcomes. And then I guess the, the most important point from this is the total number of cases or lives that we had in this study was 550,000. Over uh, close to half a million individuals were included in this study. It's an amazing, amazing database. So we published that first study was in the entire cohort, and then we looked at a sub-cohort, and these were the, only the people who had diabetes mellitus, because again, those are the individuals, or that's the situation that we feel best represents the importance of medical dental integration. So I'm gonna show you this data. It's a little bit hard to read. And I'm just here gonna show you um, some cost data. And I'll ask you to focus on the second set of information. So we, we grouped the individuals into, did you have any dental care? Did you see a dentist for any reason? Emergency, cleaning, exam. Did you have any preventive care, which is either maintenance or uh, scaling and root planing? Did you have preventive care, but you but did not have an endodontic, the need for endodontic therapy or, or oral surgery, tooth removal, because that was our surrogate for a person who had significant oral infection. Preventative care with extraction or endodontics. And, ex, and then the, the last group was the, the uh, had, had an extraction or endodontic therapy, but no preventive care. And if you could look at the numbers just to the right of that, you can see that the, the savings for all groups except the last one were significant. And in parentheses is the 95% confidence interval. Uh, and as long as it doesn't cross one, that it, it's, it's statistically significant. So what we saw that it was there were significant savings in terms of medical costs if patients had access to preventive dental care. What I did not show you is data we have on in terms of the dose response effect. The New York State Medicaid uh, program allows two of these cleaning visits per year. So we looked at over the course of two years, did you have one, did you have two, did you have three, or had four, and we saw this stepwise progression. The more visits you had, the better the outcomes were, the more the cost savings were, and the, and the most, uh, and, and that was also true for utilization, it was also further down. Most of the savings were in inpatient admissions, which as we know, in the treatment of people who have chronic diseases, it's the inpatient costs that drive about 70% of the total expenditure. So let me conclude with summarizing these three parts of, my, of the, the case I'm trying to make. Using simple screening tools, patients with undiagnosed dysglycemia can be identified in the dental office. Again, we're not making a diagnosis. We're identifying risk. We're then referring to a medical, one of our medical colleagues, to make the diagnosis. <clears throat> Point number two, preventive dental care, conservative periodontal treatment is associated with clinically significant reductions in HbA1c, an important risk factor for complications of diabetes mellitus. And we've had cases, and there aren't enough really to report formally, in which patients who are not being, who are seeing a physician, were being managed medically, but were not seeing the results that they would have expected, who then had this conservative therapy, in fact, did then see better control as indicated by HbA1c. And lastly, and this is, again, these are controversial studies, but I think particularly, particularly important, preventive dental care, conservative parental treatment is associated with improved health outcomes. This is not a, a simple topic. I recognize that, I think, I think we all do. But the data is, I think, uh, convincing. And, and, and what I've hoped to do this morning is really provide you with a quantitative rationale. There are ethical rationales, there are moral, eth mor moral rationales, but this data, and I think we have to rely ultimately on data, <coughs> says this is an opportunity that we're, we're missing. So thank you. Good morning. I'm Bruce Donoff. I've been a member of the American College of Dentists for far too many years. And the last time I was at a national meeting was in San Francisco um, with Mike Alfano and uh, Marjorie Jeffcoat to induce a friend from NYU. Um, 
but I'm very pleased to be here because medical dental integration, whether it be the ethics side or the education side, is one of my passions. <clears throat> so, in 1982, I had just become a professor at Harvard. I had just become head of the department. I had just become chief of the service at Mass General Hospital. But I always saw patients. And I went down to see a patient who I had seen before. He needed a tooth out. Uh, and I had no trouble taking a tooth out before. But he put his hand up and he said, Doc, put on gloves. I said, what do you mean? He said, I just came back from Seattle <clears throat> where I had a bone marrow transplant and developed graft versus host disease. And I have something called AIDS. I put on gloves and so did all of you in 1982 and we still wear them. An event like that can change things. And it do doesn't always have to be a disease implicated event, but it can be an educational event. So we should remember that. My talk is entitled, Redesigning and Improving Healthcare, Integrating Oral, Medi Oral and Medical Research and Practice. And the reason I have research on this is I've been serving on an NIDCR working group that's looking at issues in terms of applicants for research grants and applicants for PhD programs. Um, there's a wonderful book called Innovation and Its Enemies, and the question is, with everything that's going on in the profession, in terms of maintaining the status quo, can we create medical dental champions for change. I think last year, this group heard from one of my colleagues, Dr. Lisa Simon, who was on this program, who's someone who went through the dental school and the medical school, and is now joining the internal medicine and primary care staff at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. These are the kind of people who can become champions, and I'll explain why. So let me discuss some of the history of this, as soon as I figure this out. So there's been huge changes in the scope of dental practice. I often think, where would we be if implants didn't come around? Interestingly, I did my first dental implant in 1982. But in those days, I had to go take a week's course with a whole group from Sweden and we marked down every implant that we did to keep a, a, a log of all of that, and that's gone by the wayside. Not to say that implantology isn't important, but I think what I would like to emphasize is oral health and primary care. Change versus continuity, innovation versus incumbency. A little disruptive innovation is a theory of a good friend of mine who's passed away at the business school, Clay Christensen, who believes that lots of innovations start low and have a small cadre of, of uh, participants. And I think that's the way that oral health and primary care is gonna start. But on occasion, we have a catalytic mechanism, and I like catalytic mechanisms too, because they really, really change things fast. A brief history, just so we remember where we are. What if the Baltimore College of Dentistry had been accepted by the University of Maryland? We wouldn't be here. The Harvard Dental School started in 1867. I was in the centennial class. In the 80s, five dental schools closed. Why? Well, I knew a couple, a very good one, Wash U in St. Louis, and the main reason it closed is because the medical faculty wanted the space, believe it or not, and they had their way. But then Arizona and Jack Dillenberg entered the fray, and public health became an important part of our, our profession. But most of the new schools have been predominantly osteopathic-associated schools, and there have been few true university-based dental schools. <clears throat> there have been attempts at medical dental 
education integration, the Geyser Report said that dentistry should always be aligned but separate from medicine. What if Alfred Ory had his way and not William Guy's? In the 1930s, a Dean Winterlitz at Yale Medical School started an MD program for dentists at Yale. And just a few of the people who went through that, Burke at Kreshover and Weisberger, did some amazing things. Lester Burke had started the whole field of oral medicine. Cy Kreshover was head of the NIH for a number of years. In 1940, Harvard undertook an experiment giving dual degrees. It was interrupted by the war and so never came to fruition. And in 1971, <clears throat> a program that I'm a product of, the Harvard MGH Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Program came about because it was felt by leadership at that time, Walter Gorelnik and Jerry Austin, that an MD would allow general surgery to be taken at the correct level of responsibility. <clears throat> there have been a number of reports of importance, lots of reports, lots of words. We need action, the guys report and flex the report. Dental education at the crossroads in 1995, a wonderful study from the Institute of Medicine read by 8% of dentists. The 21st Century Guys report by Adia in 2017, and most recently, a follow-up to the Satch Oral Health Report, Oral Health in America 2021. Hundreds of words, hundreds of words, and not a lot of action items. <clears throat> Sitting on this NIH working group, there are a number of priorities at the NIDCR to integrate oral and general health, develop more precise and individualized treatment, translate and implement science, diverse research pipeline, and partner and collaborate. But fewer and fewer people in our profession are going into science, and it's worrisome. Why don't we have a medical treatment for periodontal disease after all these years? No one has won, only one person, surgical personality has won a Nobel Prize. Joe Murray for kidney transplants. Everything else relates to medicine and intricacies of the body's systems. Change is hard. Atul Gawande, a noted author and also a physician, <clears throat> talks about slow ideas. Ether anesthesia, when it was introduced in the early 1800s, was adopted very quickly. Why? Although it was mainly used for amputations, that was the main operation at the time, because it helped the doctor. Asepsis, Lister's contribution, took many, many years to catch on, because it was hard work for people to implement uh, aseptic technique. Real change, as mentioned by Linsky, adaptive versus technical change, adaptive change changes the culture. It, it really ca causes change. It's not just a technical change. And it always involves a loss for someone. That's the problem. So two stories from 1973, just because I like to tell stories. In 1973, there was a great racehorse named Secretariat. He won the uh, Kentucky Derby, then he won the Preakness Stakes, and then he stopped training well. He used to consume 23 bales of hay, and he went down to one. And no one knew why until the vet came to see him. He had an abscessed tooth. The tooth was drained, and he won the Belmont Stakes by 23 and a half furlongs. So oral health counts. <laughs> the unfortunate patient was when I was back in medical school at a particular hospital, they used to call on me for oral consults, even though I was a medical student, because physicians don't look in the mouth, and they still don't. Um, a patient with a fever of 106, almost comatose, no source of infection, abscess third molar. Crazy. It was the first malpractice case in Massachusetts. And I remember the 
Lubin and Meyer were the attorneys. They became very famous as malpractice attorneys. And after the case, they said, Doc, you were great. What can we do for you? Can we get you a bottle of wine? I think things have changed. The Jupiter trial for C-reactive protein and statins that I bet you a lot of people take statins here, okay, involved 173,000 patients and there was not one dentist in the study. Sad. And the As the Student comments on learning science and patient care vary, but I know Marco has presented some data on an ADA survey, but I'm not sure that still holds. I wrote a long time ago, it's time for a new guy's report in 2008, and I think that's true. And in 2016, along with uh, several people, uh, Dr. McDonough and others in the New England Journal, we talked about integrating oral and general health with payment systems and education. This was a, a Alan Formacola and Howard Baylitz attempt at the 21st century guy's report, but we have implicated an oral health project where primary care and dental services are integrated. At the present time, it involves a nurse practitioner, but it involves students and dental patients who don't have primary care physicians are welcome to join this practice. So lots of things are possible. The paper on the right, Oral Health Care in the 21st Century, is a paper I wrote with George Daly, who's still the dean of the medical school, talking about the potential to add an MD program to people going into primary care, and not oral surgery. Uh, and some schools are trying it. UMass is trying it, and Harvard is still trying to do it. Um, and someday we will. Oral Health Care for All was a summary report of the recent NIDCR report on oral health that some of you have seen. I bet you didn't read it, it's multiple pages. But the more important piece on this is behind health robbing ailments, inflammation, periodontal disease is not mentioned once in this New York Times article. And that's one of the problems we face. So what are the options for change? Well, the NIH has already transformed the PBRN to PrimeEd. We can uh, change the practice acts, not easy. We can uh, add interprofessional education and practice with nurse practitioners. We can change dental education, not easy. Uh, we can do, give dual degrees in residency in family medicine or primary care, possible. We can give a DMDMD dental school to medical school, or DMD DMD medical school to dental school, something with, we're experimenting with UMass Medical School. So there are a number of options. You just have to be willing to try. Listening to Ira talk about diabetes, I'll never forget being in a meeting in Washington, D.C., and it was a, a meeting like this. Um, but the American Diabetes Association was meeting down the hall. And I spent one day at the American Diabetes Association. They did not mention oral health once. So it's where you stand. We need to, the practice of the future needs to be teams. We have the cleft palate teams. We've shown that it works with integrated care, integrated financing and true interprofessional inter practice. Most of what we're doing does not work. We need to be like Walmart, not like Best Buy and other specialty stores, very much like you used to always go to a gas station for gas and a, a convenience store for food or drink. You now can get them both in one place. And that's what we need to do in oral health and primary care. Lots of reports, lots of words. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But in fact, uh, the pandemic may have given us a chance to do something like the glove story that I started this talk with. Um, 
The alliance between medicine and dentistry is more important now than ever. It signals a commitment to science. I do not think that the status quo is inevitable, and I promise not to die before I do something about it. <laughs> Thank you. La Cascada Declaration from South America talks about dual education. If you haven't seen it, it's an excellent document. We formed the Harvard Initiative for Integration and the Center for, Primary, for Integration of Primary Care, and our job is to produce champions for this. And everybody can contribute. We started a leadership series for this, and the Initiative for Integration of Medicine and Oral Health has a yearly conference. It's now run by Jane Barrow at our institution. And this is our world. You see up in the left, the IOM report, Dental Education at the Crosswords, the, color of, the academic colors of medicine and dentistry together. In fact, one of the options was a dual degree for advancing the, our profession. The guys report in the middle, the innovator's dilemma, which was Clay Christensen's first uh, attempt to talk about in a disruptive innovation. Blue Ocean Strategy. Blue Ocean Strategy is Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus doesn't exist anymore. But Cirque du Soleil does. And my favorite, the Oreo package that you just pull and it opens with one full swipe so you can get to the cookies quick. <laughs> so here is the Harvard, the Initiative for Integrating Oral Health and Medicine and SIPCO, which was grant funded. And this is a quote from one of my favorite people, Louis Menand, the marketplace of ideas. The key to reform of almost any kind in higher education lies not in the way that knowledge is produced, it lies in the way that the producers of knowledge are produced. And the little insert is a paper that Lisa Simon and I wrote as an editorial in our journal uh, last spring and it's worth reading, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Donoff. What's, what wonderful presentations from all three of our speakers. So thank you so much. Um, so we have a few questions for you all. Um, Dr. Tomar hasn't had a chance to <laughs> say anything with his mic. Turn the here. Oh, there there you are. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you all for uh, for wonderful uh, presentations. Um, I wonder if I could uh, kick it off with with some questions. Um, actually, I'll, I'll start with uh, with with you, uh, Marco. Um, so you know, we know that getting the medical community interested in oral health is is just so hard. Um, you know, I certainly hear from from uh, colleagues that are physicians, nurses, you know, PAs, nurse practitioners that they already have so much on their checklist that they have to cover during, uh, during a patient visit. What needs to change to get the medical community truly committed to incorporating oral health into primary care? Look, fundamentally, you need to get oral health on these checklists, on these care protocols, right? So you think of a medical system, this is, this is not Bruce practices this way, Ira practices this way. There's much more of that standardization of care, right? So the question is, how would I get referral to an oral screening on the checklist for, I just diagnosed you with diabetes, right? So that, and chime in guys, but that requires US Preventive Services Task Force, different agencies that regulate to have that kind of mandate come down. So fundamentally, a lot of this requires advocacy from the oral health community, right, to do this. And bluntly, I don't know where this stands in all the priorities. There's lots of priorities for lobbying, right? There's fixed dental insurance and X, Y, Z and all that. So I'm fundamentally convinced there is an opening here to do this. We just need to get on the same page and make this a priority. And if we don't have the evidence to convince those authorities, then let's generate that evidence. I don't agree. I think we do have the evidence. Um, 
but it, it's fundamentally just a sea change in vision for the profession. Like that's the big thing. And then the tactics we can work on, but I don't know how many dentists are like, yes, that's priority number one, honestly, given all the things that are happening. I would add that I think more than a quarter of the general health um, practice in our country is administered by non-physicians. Yes, physician that, that just came out. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, nurse practitioners, and yet dental therapists remain a great source of contention, despite the fact that orthodontists thrive by having multiple assistants in their office who can help. We need to talk about that. So, so there's, there's been attempts <clears throat> to do what you are suggesting. They've been targeted, specific, and limited. So maybe if the college is going to do this as a year-long study, they could then begin to plan for how do we bring all of the entities together to have a single voice or a single front to approach those that need to hear this. We've, we've tried it individually. When, at Columbia, we found, well, we first wanted to get some dental uh, lectures into the medical school curriculum, and we did, and we got six hours or eight hours. I mean, it means nothing in, in terms of the long-term training. So what we decided to do, as opposed to focusing on students, for example, is we started to focus on those individual training programs medical training programs, such as the endocrinology, such as OBGYN, where these issues really are very much there for. We were not successful with cardiology, but we did have, and again, on a limited basis, we did have some success in terms of showing the data, and I think that's why I focused on this. I think you have to have the quantitative data. You have to have the data in order to develop the rationale. Uh, and, but I do think the college has an opportunity over the next year as you begin to do this, to begin to marshal the resources and bring people together so we, we uh, are not individuals you know, with, with a light in the, in the darkness, but really something much more substantial. Next week, the American College of Surgeons is meeting in Boston, and I'm gonna stop by, I'm a member. But when the dual degree oral surgery program started, the American College of Surgeons accepted only dual degree oral surgeons. But that changed. They formed a section and now single degree oral and maxillofacial surgeons eligible. So those kinds of possibilities exist. For, for Ira, if we did adopt a new paradigm in dental education, um, how would that be addressed, do you think? How do we move that forward? Well, that's a tremendous challenge, as you, as you know. Um, so I'm gonna say something that probably pe many people in this room won't agree with. It's impossible to educate a fully formed dental provider in four years. There simply is too much information, both didactic information and clinical experiences that are necessary. As you know, in New York State, I think we had some partial success by mandating a PG, PGY1. Uh, so, but I think the, it, it's gonna, unfortunately, gonna probably have to start with the Council on Dental Accreditation. Because if it's in the requirements for accreditation, it'll be done. And I think there has to be more, it has to be specifically written as to what we're, what we're intending or what we think should be done in order to uh, prepare our, our, the young dentists for the, for the future. But unfortunately, I think it's gonna to have to be, has to start that, that way. Because other than that, there are 70 dental schools and we're all gonna teach what, in quotes, is basic sciences differently. And with lesser and greater uh, focus. Excellent point. So, so Bruce, you had talked about the, uh, the Center for Integration of Medical and Dental Care established at Harvard. If we were to do that on a, on a national scale, um, who would, who would be the lead for that? You think NIDCR, or Institute of Medicine, who would potentially spearhead that? Well, you know, when Hal Slavkin became director of the NIDR at that time, National Institute of Dental Research, he lobbied and changed the name to the National Institutes of Dental and Craniofacial Research. So it's possible to change the name of that institute to include the notion and the ideas 
of integration. So that's one place. I think the other thing is to create a, 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 f a freestanding center for integration and invite people to join the ADA, the AMA, the a, um, uh, ADEA, um, uh, AAMC. These are the groups that should get together so physicians and dentists are talking to each other. Not easy, but possible. Why not? Why not? I was at the inauguration of the new Harvard president last week, and she kept saying, why no, why not? For, for Marco, um, what do you think it will take for the medical dental integration to move faster, and do you anticipate any accelerating factors in the near future that might push things forward? Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. Um, definitely, so to part B of your question, Again, the reason why I showed this generational turnover uh, concept among the provider community, among dentists, is I do fundamentally believe, and the data support this when you look at surveys of fourth year dental students, right? There is a change in terms of openness to collaboration outside of dentistry, kind of getting outside the silo. Part of that's because we've been training them with slightly differently, more exposure to nurses and physicians, et cetera. Um, so I definitely think that's one of the kind of tailwinds that's happening. Just I think younger dentists, I don't, this will come across the wrong way, but there, there's less like baggage, right? There isn't like a status quo they're looking at and like dying to preserve. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm trained, I'm going in, and I'll see what my options are, right? Um, but I, I do want to come back to this issue of, it's a challenge for you and for us as a profession. I say us even though I'm not a clinician, but... I don't see a true north here. I don't see a 30-year strategy on what we want to become. It's kind of like react to change as it comes up. And I look at behavioral health as a complete counterexample, right? 20 years ago, that community said, no more backwater. Mental health is core health. It's all those statements that were on the screen. Can't be healthy without mental health. But look where they've come in 20 years. Like think about where you or your children or your grandchildren are screened for mental health and anxiety. Like it's on every form. I enroll my kids in sports camps. It's like, have you felt down? Have you felt anxiety? It's a completely different paradigm. It's codified in the Affordable Care Act as an essential services. Think about who covers now therapy sessions and anxiety prescription medication. That wasn't like that 20 years ago. Because that community said, that's our true north. We want to expand access to these services. It's a challenge for us, and I'd like to hear questions. What is our true north? Like, what do we want different tomorrow? And is this integration part of that as a profession? Or is it like, no, we want everything to stay as it is, and we'll kind of react to change as it comes? Very, very different. And those are not easy discussions. I don't mean to, to, yeah. to be flippant about it, but they're very hard. And it's about the core identity of who you are as a profession. And that's not easy. Let me go back to this year-long program that you're going to be beginning. The most important thing is it should not result in another thick report that sits on a desk or sits in a, sits in a bookshelf and it gets no, no daylight after that. There's, there must be a roadmap created as to how to move forward. Who are the potential partners? Who is, who is going to be contacting those partners? Can they be part of the process, let's say after this, maybe the second half of the year, to, to, to actually engage them in this? Because what's, worked, what's, what's happened in the past simply has, has not worked. And, and it's gotta be really action-oriented. As a follow-up, who do you see as the primary stakeholders that need to be at the table? <laughs> Well, we, we've had limited success in talking to the endocrinologists. We had great success talking to the diabetes educators. Um, you know, it, they're not the top of the pyramid, not the top of the food chain, but they still are the ones who manage patients on a day-to-day on a -day and week-to-week -week basis. Uh, so again, it has to be selective and it has to be identified based on who, who sees contact. We, we found when we dealt with individual residency programs, or fellowship programs at Columbia, we got great, great buy-in. 
great buy-in. But it was it was one to one, and the credibility had been established before we we went in. So again, it's a question of maybe the, a document sort of laying the case out, and then the action items. I would recommend family medicine. We've had great success dealing with family medicine departments, particularly at UMass uh, and at Brown, and now at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock. All very good medical schools that don't have dental dental schools, mm -hmm. which is another consideration. So, so shifting a little bit to creating the, the next generation of, of oral health care professionals, I know we, we saw some of the, the data on the demographic trends, but you know, for, for those of us that have spent much of our careers in in dental academia, and certainly I know that there's many uh, dental educators in the audience. Uh, dental school curricula are just notoriously crowded. Um, it's really, really difficult to change. What advice, and I'll put this out to all of you, what advice can you offer to long-established dental schools on how they can foster greater medical dental integration into their pre-doctoral dental programs? Is, is that a constraint, though? I mean, I don't see, you've all sat in dental schools. Right? Do you feel that's the constraint, though? That, that some awareness is missing or some, I don't know how to do an A1C test or I don't know, because to me, it, it's like when I look at, let's say this referral model, right? It's like the, the constraints are in what's covered in terms of dentistry as a lot of things that's not covered like Medicare and even insurance plans for dental don't cover everything. So there's that as a constraint and then there's the literally the nuts and bolts of how do you do a referral system that's closed. Like I don't, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see the education method to be a constraint for dentists to participate more closely with, with medicine. But is it? I don't know. You guys all sit in schools. Look, so. interprofessional education, or at least in some form, exists now in every, most dental schools. I'm sure it'll eventually be all dental schools. But, but the question is, can, there's a busyness factor. Supposedly, there's a busyness factor. Dentists are complaining they're not as busy as they, they could be. If we teach how to talk to our colleagues in medicine, in, in nursing, in PAs, what, what have you, the idea that you establish a collaboration uh, with, with another provider, a group of providers in your town, I, I think there's an incentive there in terms of just generating patients. And, and maybe that's how we have to, have to begin. One of the things that happened to me when I was in, I had a limited practice, is I ended up in conversation with local endocrinologists because I was seeing their patients. That led to a further discussion, and then patients started to flow, not in great numbers, but started to flow from their offices to mine, and then, of course, from my offices okay. to theirs. So it was a grassroots effort, but that sort of thing can be encouraged in dental schools, and I think we'll, we'll begin to convince both sides that this is worthwhile. And in professional education is one of the code of standards, so that is one of the things that we are needing to do, right? Yeah, but so is research. You know, if, if you want a code of standards, you say code of say it. Dental schools should force the research. Boom, there it is. It's, a, it's not the greatest system, right. in my opinion. How, how, what, are there teeth? Are there teeth in that standard? And I don't think there are. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, when I first became dean, I'm a storyteller, so I'll tell another one. Um, I assembled all the executive directors and presidents of dental societies in New England and asked them their thoughts about a mandatory internship year for dental graduates, which doesn't exist. It's immediately put off as a fifth year of dental school, which it's not. Okay, and I'll never forget meeting at the school with these people, great people who I knew well, and um, you don't need that, do you? I spent two years in the Army after dental school. It was the greatest two years of my life. I spent three years in the Air Force, so they did it, okay? The first dental internship in Vermont is being established this year. There is none. Um, can you, along kind of those same lines, can you share examples of healthcare systems or organizations that have successfully 
incorporated medical dental care models? Well, Harvard was always based on it. The dental students are in the medical school the first year and a half. Um, and um, they still turn out being pretty good dentists. Although I do hold the world record for the fewest number of blue wax carved teeth in Harvard history. <laughs> One, because I didn't see any reason for carving blue wax when you could take care of patients. But, you know, UCLA, UConn, I just saw a graduate who's now in UConn. I don't know if she's here today. Um, um, Stony Brook, where Howard Oaks was the founding dean, all followed that system. Um, and it, it seemed to work. I'm not sure it's working as well now, but that's a system that can work. And on this, in practice, right, like this is what's exciting. There's, there's a lot, I, I would call it meaningful experimentation and solutions at small scale, right? So there's lots of, lots of clinics that collaborate. There's lots of practices in my town. I have relationships with the pediatricians. There's lots of this, right? What the challenge is, is I have not seen anything at scale un right. until what recently happened in Oregon. So Oregon, the Medicaid population is managed in ACOs, they call them CCOs, but accountable care organizations. So think of it as you manage a population and it's, it's not like capitation in the 80s. It's a lot of, a lot of those problems have been solved, right? But as far as I know, they're the only large scale health system where part of their 20 scorecard measures is the percent of newly diagnosed diabetics who had a dental screening within 12 months or within six months. So that to me is, that's meaningful. That is statewide, it's the whole Medicaid adult population, and it's an actual quality metric that the organization is evaluated on. So that to me is something where like, that's been a big development, right? Yeah. To go from something that's experimentation and small scale to very systems wide. I don't know how they did it, why they did it. That'd be a good case study. How did it get there? What was it? Right? It's interesting. I sit on a board of a federally qualified health center on Cape Cod, and getting ACOs accepted in Massachusetts is not easy, although it has a very unique thing that I would recommend to all states. The Medical Society has an oral health committee. Mm -hmm. Some of you may have heard Hugh Silk, who started mm -hmm. this who's yeah. a family practitioner, a great advocate for oral health. Those are the kind of people that you need at your side. So, uh, let me... Is New York gonna do this? I don't know, yeah. I don't know. You, pat, you add dental benefits to the Medicare program. Th that'll generate it. Very controversial, I understand that, but it's, a, it's something that uh, is long overdue, and I think that, more than anything else, will generate the collaboration that's required. But I understand it's, that's not a simple, it's not a simple from the CMS side, it's not a simple from the from organi organized yeah. dentistry side, but it, it has to be taken up. And I think that will, will be a major push towards this becoming a reality. Are, are there any international models? You know, we talked about, you, know, you mentioned the Oregon, but are there other countries where um, they're, they're much further along on, on a mental, uh, medical uh, dental integration. Less than you'd think. Um, a lot of the OECD has models that mimic ours here, right? Where even, you know, I'm from Canada, right? So the, the, the national healthcare system there, dentistry is just like it is in the US, right? Employer provided or very small, small social program. But it was interesting, I did some work in Malaysia and there, when you go for prenatal visits in Malaysia, you go, you get barcodes scanned on what's getting done for your visit today. It's this test, it's this sonogram, et cetera. And an oral health screening is part of that. So there's another example where I found, wow, in their whole national health system, they're saying pregnant women, part of your regular care is a dental screening. Joint That's one visits example. Are very important. Some of the federally qualified health centers have been doing joint visits for behavioral health for years and the Cambridge Health Alliance, one of the hospitals that um, in the Harvard realm, uh, Brian Swan, who some of you may know, was the first dental di uh, director, 
and they had joint medical dental visits. And we always called it the oral physician program, and it's still going. You know, I don't know if there are any clinical examples uh, in, in terms of clinical care, but I know what, what is different in, in Europe as opposed to the United States is the collaboration between the professional organizations I think is much stronger in Europe than it is here. The European Federation of Periodontology, for example, has terrific relationships with the cardiology group and the diabetes group in Europe, much stronger than, than we have here. How they've done it is, is something I, I don't know the details, but, it, but it's a way at least of communicating on that level the advantages of, of uh, collaboration. Innsbruck has a joint program for medical and dental students. Same program, except most of them who get their MDs go off into oral and maxillofacial surgery. Separate again, right? Okay. Yeah. Shall we? Did you want to open up? To yes, me? we'd like to open up um, questions honor. from the audience at this point. There's a microphone in the center. Um, feel free to to jump in. You know, Colgate years ago had that statement, oral systemic connection, remember that? And somehow or another they got away from that. But that was originally supposed to be exactly what you're saying in terms of recognizing the periodontal problems associated with the medical problems. Sidebar, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry and the American Academy of Pediatrics collaborated and said, we do not need to have children waiting until they're three years of age to see a pediatric dentist. And that's the collaboration that they made as a member of the Medical Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. And that's the kind of collaboration that can be done with, and I forget your name in the middle. Marco, the, Marco, yeah. Marco. You should be the leader of the collaboration of getting these people together. Yeah, yeah. very good. This is an excellent point, but it, I, I didn't catch your name, right? Dr. Lauren Alves. Excellent. But uh, the important thing there, right, is for the children, that became easier because all Medicaid programs must cover children's care, right? At least even pre-ACA, but post-ACA, pediatric dental was a mandated benefit. We have 9% of U.S. kids only that lack dental coverage, right? That's gone down dramatically from 20 years ago where it was 25, right? So absolutely 100% agree with children. I think though we've, we've had a different approach. We've somehow said we're okay with mandatory coverage in all programs for dental care, but for adults and kids, we haven't yeah. as a profession kind of gone there. So great point though. I think we can learn a lot from the pediatric experience. I want to reinforce that. Well, thank you, Marco, for saying that, because I'm a pediatric dentist as well. Um, I was the uh, access chair um, for Wisconsin back from 81 to 84. I was the a um, access to care chairman for the American Dental Association and prevention chair for the Dental American Dental Association when there was a CAPER Council. That's a Council on Access right. Prevention and interprofessional relations. That got killed, and we were supposed to have our last meeting the day after September 11th. And obviously that meeting didn't happen. Homeland Security took over, and we lost the interprofessional relations part of that council. That council had JACO on it. It had the American Hospital Association in it. It had the American Medical Association in it, and you can name on one after another, all the dental specialties, et cetera. Mm. And uh, we lost that. And I think that uh, when I was the access chair, I co-wrote uh, the definition of uh, early childhood dental caries with uh, Admiral Dr. Moss, uh, Bill Moss. And uh, that was finally adopted by the American Medical Associ um, Dental Association at the House of Delegates uh, right after the year after 9-11. And, uh, and I just happened to be at the meeting. I was no longer in charge of anything. And, uh, and it just so happened I got drafted into the House because uh, a lot of members did not want to come 
and fly to that meeting. If we, uh, and the things that happened with the Surgeon General's conference didn't happen by accident. As he mentioned, it took a number of different individuals within the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry and the American Academy of Pediatrics because in 1988, our current hospital in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, denied having any ADA brochures in their hospital because the pediatricians felt that children should not have to be seen until age five. And our brochure at that time said 18 months. Well, I'm an, I have some Irish and I, that got the Irish up in me, okay? And uh, so I ended up becoming very politically active after that. And so I was able to attend the Surgeon General's conference. And one, one of the main concerns we had at that conference is there was someone in the CDC that didn't like fluoridation because they had a little burr under their saddle. And so we, we went in and thought we were going to be ambushed as the American Dental Association. And I kind of represented CAPER at the time at that meeting. And as it turned out, the American Academy of Pediatrics said 25% of the, of the health care dollar for children should be going to oral health care. And they went on with study after study, and they talked about not only children that uh, have good, uh, good health otherwise, but they also talked about children and, and its effect upon their schools as far as absence from schools, the children that had uh, mental and uh, physical uh, disabilities, that's what they called it at the time. Uh, that was affected too as well. And so it, it wasn't a happenstance thing because uh, the Council on Access and Interprofessional Relations was heavily involved with that Surgeon General's Conference. And so was the American Dental Association uh, and, and other specialty groups. But, uh, you know, he's right. Stuff like that doesn't happen by chance. Sometimes what happens, and I would suggest that we get that interprofessional relations council back on board and have people like Marco and you guys up there as part of it, as well as the original group like Jayco. In other words, for you to get hospital accreditation, you have to follow these steps. Boom, 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 boom. And the idea, same thing with uh, accreditation of the dental schools and, and whatever they do at the medical school level too as well. Um, the biggest hurdle that we have has always been government because at the time where the American Academy of Pediatrics said 25% of the healthcare dollar, it was 1%. And uh, you know, nothing happens when that happens. And we were lucky in our community that we ended up getting a croc center, a Ray Kroc and his wife uh, founded McDonald's. And uh, we competed with a whole bunch of cities and we ended up getting it. And then the Rotary Club got involved and through collaboration between that organization and our local dental society, now we have a, a free clinic in our, in our area that is Heavily, uh, a lot of the millennials and Generation Zs are heavily involved in it, even though they're under this mass of debt, because it gave them the opportunity to serve. And if you can give the opportunity to serve by doing some collaboration, I think you will have, you will see change. And I suggest that if we're really concerned about this diabetes problem, that that we make it mandatory at the medical uh, education level that they look at the periodontal aspect of the patients they see, and dentists, we look at the H1AC. And that's part of our education, and just becomes just like they take the blood pressure every time they see an adult patient, they do the H1AC on a periodic basis. Thank you for the comments. Marco asked, what is our true north? My name is Dr. Mohab Ruscala. Many of you know me as the author and filer of Question 2 in Massachusetts, which established an 83% medical loss ratio 
for the first time in this country. What is our true north? I'd like to answer that question and dovetail it into the topic of dental medical integration. We do need dental and medical integration on so many levels, but the only way we're going to get dental and medical integration, which was already answered by Marco, is to have coverage. It's what? Co coverage. Coverage for it. The question is, how do we establish coverage for dental and medical integration? There have been conversations already up at the, up at the, at the front here saying we need to get dental coverage into medical coverage in Medicare. Okay? That also would apply to Medicaid. But ultimately, there's a problem. There's a barrier. How do we get that coverage? Let me tell you what the barrier is because nobody's talking about this. Okay? This is my world. This is where I work all the time. The problem with getting coverage for dental in medical is that procedures for dental are not that big. Now, you go get your medical insurance, whether you have private insurance or if you have public insurance, you get, if you're in the private world, you have to pay deductibles, okay? But those deductibles will stop you from getting dental care, right? Because your dental care is not that expensive. So they would have to reformulate insurance, medical insurance, so that there was a dental subsection in your medical insurance so that your deductibles did not prohibit you from getting dental care. See the problem? That's the problem. Because for the, for, for the reality is that medical care is not for minor preventive work. The majority of what we are paying for in our med medical care is actually for catastrophic care. But dentistry is not catastrophic care. That's the problem, okay? We've really got to understand that, and that's why I started with Marco's fantastic question. What is true north? True north is knowing that's our barrier, and, and, and the, our ability to get past that barrier may be a long-term solution. But in the short term, how do we get coverage? The answer is a federal medical loss ratio that doesn't just apply to Massachusetts, it applies across the country. And in my strong opinion, that is point one of True North. That's what we need. Point two, and this should be the focus of ACD, ADA, every single dental organization should be focused on these two things. Number one, federal medical loss ratio. The number two is there are five existing Medicaid laws. I wrote question two. I made that law. But there, you don't need to make a law. In the five Medicaid laws, which is my point too, there are five Medicaid laws that are federal laws. They are not options, they are requirements. They must be followed and no state in this country follows those if they were followed. And if as the ADA, the ACD, all of the different leadership in this country, if we made a federal medical loss ratio and those five laws covered, you would have the coverage you need to be able to pay for all of the medical integration we're talking about. Thank you. So I'm, I'm another pediatric dentist. I'm Martha Ann Kiels for North Carolina. So Mark, I wanted to throw out an innovative idea that I am a fortunate private practitioner that um, our practice does have uh, running Eagle Soft and Epic side by side because we have elected to maintain privileges at Duke and UNC. And because of that, every day on Epic, I'm able to enter in as a diagnosis dental caries and then maybe say I have a severe concern about this child's diet. I can enter in delayed eruption. I'm concerned about this child's growth home. Early loss of teeth. I'm concerned about the neutrophil function. And to get to your point about talking, um, doctors don't have time to talk to us and we don't have time to talk to them. It's electronic communication and my wish for ACD and ADA and, a and the ADD is to um, talk to the number one electronic health care providers in medicine, one being Epic, and get every pra practitioner the way to have that parallel in their office so they can run Dentrex and Epic, Eaglesoft and Epic. You don't have to run Wisdom, that's e Epic's version. And I choose not to because it's not as good as Eagle Software Dentrex. But when you start talking like that electronically, then the nurse practitioner, the dietitian, people 
behind the scenes, like you communicate behind the scenes electronically, and I'm in that second bump because I'm almost 70, but I'm communicating with that first bump, and that first bump is on their phones all the time, you know, reading my note that I put in Epic, and I mean, I actually just did it twice already, communicating about a child that's got a severe immune complex. I've communicated in a matter of seconds with a team of 10 doctors. So we're all on the same page, but I think that's my wish when you're innovating is to give my gift that I would give every private dentist, whether you choose to practice corporate, wherever you're practicing, you're paralleling electronic healthcare record until we can figure out what he just mentioned about how we're gonna pay for all this. But we could start today letting them know what we see so that they could move on it. And they're very, very appreciative of that. We just don't have time to talk to each other and that's my wish for us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donna Clauser. I'm a section chair for Southern California, and I wanted to thank you all for today. Um, I started a nonprofit a while back uh, regarding um, dispensing free Narcan to our youth. 76% uh, of our Gen Z population aged uh, 15 to 23 are dying from fentanyl overdose, accidental poisoning. And I've distributed about 250 Narcan uh, intranasal spray to children in my community. Um, you've spoken to me in my heart. I want to make sure that I'd like to um, ask you for uh, guidance with collaborating with our legislature, also now with medicine, pediatricians, not just pediatric dentistry that Dr. Brett Kessler uh, said, Donna, you have to be with pediatric dentists. And I said, oh my gosh, what about pediatricians? This is why these meetings are so important, because you get to meet with really brilliant people that could continue to help save lives. So thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I want to uh, praise everyone for their uh, movement in this direction. And I want to echo the comments that were made by the previous speaker. Uh, with regards to communicating with physicians. And, and I'm going to throw in the basic science element here uh, and in terms of when, I, when you have a developing system or a system that we want to develop, form follows function. And, and my question is, in the dental school setting, is how can we help our students better communicate with the physicians and other healthcare providers that our patients see? And so our students will submit a medical consult, we'll draft it, it gets faxed to the, to the practitioner's office. We may or may not hear a response. And, or, or the students will pose questions that are specific to this patient's care and what we can and cannot do for this patient within the context of everything else they're going through. Um, sometimes the physicians will just say, give us a yes or no, and really not answer their questions. So you're right, the physicians do not have time to communicate with us, but some do take the time. So before we have an electronic um, health record that we all have access to, what can we do when we get back to school next week um, to help our students to better communicate with the physicians so that they do get a response? And I think the more that, that clinicians, be it in dental schools or in private practice, community health centers, communicate with physicians and truly collaborate on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, I think that can start to at least demonstrate a need for an improvement in, this, in the infrastructure that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I think that you know, IPE has to be part of the curriculum in the first, second, third, and fourth years. It often occurs early on in the curriculum, and then by the time the students are in their clinical years and thinking about such things, including determining more about the, the medical status of a patient, that IPE experience is, is just in the background. So I think IPE certainly has to be considered as part of all four years, or three years, depending upon the length of the dental school curriculum, and it has to be reinforced. Good morning, I'm Dr. Felicia Frizzell, and I want to speak to you briefly because of, we talked about has this happened in our country? Well, I'm a former dental director at an Indian Health Service clinic, and if, I don't know how many of you know, but Indian Health Service is the government mandated care for members of federally recognized tribes. And that's the closest I've had to medical dental integration 
working one-on-one -on -one with physicians to care for my patients. However, Native Americans have the highest oral health disparities in this country. So is this model working? There is so much work that needs to be done and we need to look at all those things. The coverage, like that's huge. You know, if, there, if there's a mandate for coverage, that's great. But with Indian Health Service, there is a mandate for coverage and yet we still have poor oral health. So there's so many things that we need to address in that arena. And um, speaking from my personal experience, I feel I've made changes in my community, but it's very grassroots. And it's, you know, there's only so much I can do as one person. And I feel the biggest challenge is with collaboration. So it's just great to see all of us here together and figuring out how we can work within our major organizations to collaborate and improve the, the oral and medical health of our nation. So thank you. Hi, my name is Fernando Flores. I'm a tenured associate professor at the College of Dentistry in Oklahoma City, so the University of Oklahoma. And first, I would like to thank you for the amazing presentations and the discussion. Uh, and the question I have is, is it truly possible to have true integration without having a footprint of dental clinics in the hospitals across the country? Because life is getting more and more busy. Our patients doesn't really have the time to go to a medical appointment and then go to several dental appointments. So is it true, is it possible rather to have true integration without having us working on the same physical space? That's one part of the question. The second part is, is it possible to have true integration without having the alignment of the missions across the board of organized medicine and organized dentistry? Thanks. Hmm. Great questions. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I think you know a lot of a lot of hospital dental services were eliminated because they didn't generate enough money. Every Boston Harvard hospital had a dental service. Now there's only one left at Mass General. But the interesting thing is, um, students rotate. Where the physicians rotate is a different story. I used to teach physical diagnosis to medical students in a course called Patient Doctor One, where they learn to take a history and do a physical exam. This was so long ago that the drug companies used to give out free black bags. Now they spend that money on late night advertising of drugs that are useless. But in any case, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there is an opportunity to teach medical students to look at the mouth and to learn something about that. It's happening a little bit in Maine. We're just doing it in Rwanda, the school that Paul Farmer helped us start. But physicians, there's just no time in a medical school curriculum. They, medical students get two days of dermatology, you know, that kind of business. Everybody is worried about being a radiologist now because of artificial intelligence. Um, so there are going to be some massive changes going on, and we need to be part of them. On, on your point A, I, I mean, I agree with, with Bruce. I don't think co-location is needed. Essential. What I think the evidence suggests is much more important is that there's a closed referral made. Not here's a paper, go find a dentist, but literally, if when you're checking out, it's like, let us book that appointment for you. Now that's complicated. How do you get all those people connected? The previous speaker just talked. How does the medical record talk to the dental via Epic, et cetera? But to your first point, no. I don't think you need co-location. Your, your second one is a very insightful question. I am not sure. I'd be happy with alignment on this within the dental community. I don't even think there's alignment on this within dentistry. Maybe AC, ACD has a vision, but I don't feel all these professional organizations in dentistry are moving to like, in a decade, I want everybody referred to dental that has chronic conditions. I don't see that. So yes, it'd be great if the broader medical and healthcare community signed on to something like that, but I, fr I frankly think we need to start. And maybe that's something that in the next year ACD can do, like convene the dental stakeholders. Like start with that and really push us, like push us to be like, 
It's easy to say this is important, but are you lobbying for it? Is it top three issues? Is it not, right? Like that, that's the real thing, and I'm not sure we're there. I think we also have to understand more about how physicians are educated. There's a trend now, and you may be familiar with this, to, to shorten medical school from four to three years. The reason being that most physicians learn to be physicians when they finish medical school. I mean, the point is, so who, do we reach out, who are we reaching out to? Should we be reaching out to the medical student or should we be re reaching out to the resident or, or to the fellow? And it will have to be on that basis. But if we get an entire discipline or sub-discipline in agreement that these kinds of actions, and I'm talking about for the medical side, are potentially very worthwhile, then it might happen again. But it's institution to institution, organization to organization. You can do it on the grassroots level. You can reach out to an endocrinologist in your community. But that's not going to change the culture across the country. But let me ask this. In medical school, all right, I don't know if this is happening, but let's ask the question, for this to happen, what, what needs to change? You want, when you learn about diabetes in medical school, there's a paragraph in the book or whatever, they say, oh, by the way, gum inflammation is important, you should have that person screened for oral health. What would it take for that to happen in med school? Like, is it science? Is it, is it advocacy that needs to change? More than that. What is it? We had. We gave the medical students one day on oral health. Can you imagine that? But it's not the oral health part. It's the diabetes part. When okay. they're learning about diabetes, well, what they, would it... they get that. They get an, they get a portion of it is by by having a dental person come in and talk about. Okay. That. So that part's taken care of. It's just well, in practice. Then they get busy, and it's not a. Let me make sure. I ask you about whether you have a dentist or not. Okay. Thank you. My name is Haley Harvey. I am a dentist, um, a public health dentist that works in the hospital. I am section chief and director of dental education at Broadlands Medical Center, which happens to be a county hospital. I can affirm that having a dental clinic, 22 operatories, um, embedded inside of a hospital does not ensure medical dental integration. Um, I know that from my lived experience, I know that from a patient that I recently referred to um, ENT and oncology because I suspected squamous cell carcinoma. And how challenging that referral was, it was complicated because the patient was also on state insurance, it's not covered under dental, no oral surgeon would see them. To be clear, I'm not an oral surgeon. And so my question is, how do we also address and how do we establish our North Star when um, we don't address the elephant in the room in that our, our country, our organizations have stratifications and hierarchy, which means for me, my experience has been that physicians are higher in the hierarchy than are the dentists. In fact, there was a, um, a joke because at one point a podiatrist was chief medical officer and the joke was, well, who's lower, the podiatrist or the dentist in the hierarchy? Did you understand my question? Yeah. How are we going to address any of this integration until yeah. we address hierarchy? Yeah. I'm sorry, what state are you in? Iowa. Iowa. The great state of Iowa. I've been to okay. Iowa, and I talked at the uh, center for uh, What's it called? I forget. There's an osteopathic medical school in Des Moines, right? Um, is it DMU? Des Moines yeah. Univers mm -hmm. Medical but University? One of the things that's been suggested and hasn't come up here yet in terms of this is Richard Bansky at the University of Maryland, who heads their public health department, suggested in a paper some time ago on how to change the scope of practice. The scope of practice in dentistry has changed in a couple of ways. Sleep medicine, because you can get paid for making a thing, and a lot of phrenectomies. I've never seen so many phrenectomies done in my life. In all my years of practice, I said, I think I did three. But in any case, because they're chronic remunerative conditions, in any case, I think there can be an experiment in states where the state dental board and the state medical board permits 
medical schools and dental schools to do some things that might be prevented by the State Practice Act as an experiment and see what that leads to. No one's ever tried that. So your, your comment about the State Practice Act I think is very important. We actually looked at the definition of what is a dentist and what is a dentist allowed to do in the 50 states. Now you know the ADA has a very broad dis, uh, definition of what dentistry is, it even says you know, oral uh, in, uh, conditions, et cetera, and its effect on the body. There are about half the states that have adopted the same definition and that are about half the states are much more restrictive, actually talking about partial dentures and complete dentures and, and the like. And we found that, for example, in New York, which has a very broad definition, they were willing and interested in, uh, let's say, defending a dentist who might have taken an HbA1c in the office because the definition was broad. So I think starting with the state dental associations might be a way, I'm not sure this is exactly your question, but, but, but it's a point I think I need to make anyway, that uh, might be a way of, of, of thinking of moving this forward. The, the other thing, again, not your question, but something that came to mind, is that we, I don't know if there's ever been a legitimate high level discussion among the American Dental Association, that ADA, and the American Diabetes Association, that ADA, to really talk organization to organization about how do we collaborate. We've talked a lot about the fact that their, their, their principles or standards of care does, doesn't really mention periodontal disease or doesn't really mention the oral cavity. It, it, the, the, the approach needs to be different. I mean, it really has to happen at all levels, Gra grassroots to organizational. Let me interrupt for just one minute. We're, we're going to wrap up, up at around 11.15 so we can take one quick question and then we'll wrap up. I'll be quick. I'm Dr. April Linder Pacheco. I'm from Maryland. And I just wanted to pose to everybody a different lens that hasn't really been addressed as the general. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry. I'm short. Let's see. Is that better? Yeah. Um, I'm Dr. April Linder Pacheco. I practice in Maryland. And I just wanted to pose a different lens for everybody to think about is how do we educate the general public to care about dentistry? A lot of people only go to the dentist when they have pain, and so access to care and paying for that and everything else, especially for the public that doesn't have access, that's the only reason that they go. And so us saying, well, you have this systemic condition, diabetes, whatever, and so you should care about it from a periodontal standpoint, they may say, okay, sure, but to pay for that or to go to the dentist or do those follow-up visits, it's not inherently there. So I don't know if that has to start in the public's you know, general education in schools, elementary schools, general just populist education on social media. Somewhere that, that value of dental care and how it's important for your overall health needs to come from somewhere beyond just this intermingling and interprofessionalism because that is when the person knows they have a problem and they've already gone to their medical professional. But what about all those people who aren't even getting to that stage or aren't being asked those questions of, you know, should we have this desire or not to care about it? Even just when to go to the dentist for the first time. I think a lot of, you know, new moms, they don't even think about it. It's just they have so many other things on their mind. So the idea of going before your first birthday, the, you know, kid's first birthday or first tooth, just that general idea. I recently bought a practice and they had not been doing medical histories, let's say, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. said, okay, every patient who comes in needs to do a medical history who hasn't done one. And I had so much pushback. You're just a dentist. Why do you need to know about these things? <laughs> You know, taking their blood pressure. I had so many patients that said, I see my doctor on a regular basis. Why are you even doing this? And the education that I've had to drive this uphill battle for these patients is incredible. They don't see me as their medical healthcare team. And so it's a different story to try to get the medical profession to understand that. But if our patients are driving that force as well and asking their doctors those questions, or just generally having more value in dentistry and the way that that affects the rest of their body, I think that would help with a lot of these policy changes. You know, maybe the government will start listening if the general populace thinks it's a problem. They'll go to their policymakers. They'll start to ask those questions. And us as a profession, we're only so many people. Um, but that's Where's just something from? I've been thinking about as everyone's been talking. Here. So, thanks. 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 Yeah. I'm I'll talk to her later. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. come. What state are you from? I didn't hear Maryland. get that. Maryland. 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 I mean, my only my only reaction there is the the first of all, it, it's 
it's valuable to do, I would just temper expectations around this because, and we've done a lot of research on this, like when you poll the public and you ask them about, do you know mouth is connected to body and all this, and do you value oral health, like the results are very, very strong that they do, right? And when you look at the barriers to care, yeah. knowledge or interest in oral health is not number one, like lack of it. It's things like, I can't afford it, my insurance doesn't cover it. Like we published a lot on this. That's the reality. I know providers are like, I don't, I don't agree with that, that's okay. But I think the reality is the profession has built itself a paradigm where this is not covered or or, or some of the comments earlier. You're telling me I need this, but I'm out of my $1,000 annual limit. So now, what do you mean this is necessary? And then you have gaps, adult Medicaid, Medicare doesn't cover dental. You have all these signals in society, and like it or not, folks, like this is moving to a publicly funded system slowly. As much as the rhetoric is in politics, right? We have 8% of Americans uninsured today that is dramatically lower than pre-Obamacare, right? We have government spending on healthcare expanding. We are moving to, if it's not covered, it's not important. We are moving away from, I value your services, I'll pay out of pocket, that's gone. The next generation, if it's not covered, it's not important. So this is where, again, I'm not answering questions, but this is part of that identity crisis of the profession now. Like, if you want to still remain outside of core mainstream healthcare, don't expect to be treated equal like mainstream healthcare. Like, and both choices are valid, but you just gotta pick one. And so I really love this question because I feel the public's knowledge is not the issue. I feel it's like we have an opportunity to kind of elevate dentistry to really be core healthcare in the eyes of not just the public, which I think it already is, but in the whole healthcare community. Like that's the opportunity, but it's not easy change. And that's where we need direction from, but, from the But leader. that's where organized dentistry has to listen to you in terms of the trends that you're seeing that I think are very accurate and they have to react, they have to be reactive, or I really say proactive as opposed to reactive down the road. But that's because that by, true north, we, but it's not easy, Ira. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it, I understand why, you know, again, it's not, it's, it's on me to maybe hear the trends and here's what you should think about, but somebody has, you know, the leaders and organizers have to answer this question and pick a path, and that's not easy because we have this generational turnover and people go in for this vision of the profession, yet the world is putting okay. trends that are really kind of challenging that vision, right? So mm -hmm. it's not yeah, easy, right. it's right. exciting, but... This is where we have a chance to really recast what dentistry is and, and, and a new kind of... So we're going to allow the American College to solve this. Yeah, this you have a... <laughs> so I would just like to thank our esteemed um, panelists here for a very uh, insightful and provoking conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good debate. Very good, very good question. It was exceptional. Very good question. Did you listen? I ask because the college has a century-long history of insightful, intelligent, impatient change. And change is slow. We've been working on this for two years. I anticipate it'll take another two years to begin pushing a boulder up the hill. The fellows in this room are the agents of change, value-based ethical change. So next summer in August, Tony Ruka, Scott Tomar will be leading our fifth ethics summit on the topic of medical and dental integration. And then we'll work on an action plan, okay? Importantly, more timely, uh, course evaluations and verifications will be sent to registered participants who also complete the evaluation. Uh, I thought we were going to have the code displayed. Do we have a staff person in back working on that? Um, 
If you did not register, please email the office. Please email office at acd.org. And for those of you who registered for the uh, convocation luncheon at 11.30, that's what, 10 minutes? Uh, it's being held in Regency Ballroom TUV. For those involved in the convocation ceremony, please be in the lineup room no later than 2 p.m. For our guests attending the convocation, please be in your seats no later than 2.20. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. So you're getting this as well, right?